Good morning, Jags. Uh, this is Fahad. Today is uh, Thursday, June 4th. Good morning, gang. How's everyone doing? Good well. Good morning. Pretty good, Fahad. How are you today? Uh, doing great. Okay, so uh, uh, we will get the uh, weekly unemployment claims while we're having this uh, in about six minutes, and if you get a chance, we will cover it. The big news on the macro side this morning is the ECB decisions. And they, uh, they came out around eight o'clock and the biggest takeaway is that they increased the size of the quantitative easing program from 600 billion euros to 1.35 trillion euros. So more than doubling the size of the QE program. And they also now think that that's going to continue until, until uh, June of 2021. So there's a lot of time between now and then. So S&P futures before the CCB decision came out uh, was a bit weaker. And then we saw a little bit of a spike, a 10, 15 point spike. Not much of a movement in the S&P future, but that was the biggest thing that we noticed. But aside from that, there's not much going on. And we'll cover the unemployment claims. Now, most important thing is that uh, going on to single stocks, uh, there's only one idea. Uh, that I'm looking at this morning, and I may issue an official trade alert on this after the market closes. I was looking at it actually last night, which is Cloudflare, symbol N-E-T. Cloudflare, Cloudflare was down a little bit yesterday because software in general was acting a little bit weak. And um, if it pulls back a bit further today, I think it's going to give us a, a better entry. I'm hoping for that, actually. Um, Technically, the 28 dollar continues to be the magnet as a support, so I expect the stock to hold that. But even if it comes in below that, I think pullbacks in this one will be buying opportunities. And um, yesterday we saw in Cloudflare uh, a very interesting bullish bet. If you go out to November and you look at the 32 strike call options, you'll see 2,500 open interest there. That was not there yesterday. Somebody stepped in and they bought 2,500 of these contracts. Here's the actual picture. And they were paying up to $4.90 offer side. This was done in the morning. Then they came back in the afternoon and they bought more. So on a percent, on a, on a total dollar size basis, they bought approximately um, $1.2 million worth of call options yesterday in the November 32 Caller, but this is not the first time either. If you look at some of these other open interest in August, 30 strike calls, they were buying these as well uh, a couple of days ago. And if you go to December 25, they have been positioned in that one for quite some time. So, pretty much the entire option chain August, November, December all of that continues to be quietly. Uh, bullish position, bullish positioning, and there's not much on the on the put side. So very one-sided bullish bet. So let's see if this pulls back a little bit further, and I think it it will give us a give us an entry to get long. Now, with all of this said, Cloudflare, for those who do not know, um, it, it, you know, the, it's a very high valuation. Understand that the stock trades at more than 20 times sales, and so that's that's pretty much where all the rest of the software group is trading. Uh, but irrespective of high valuation, the research has been pointing out that NET, Cloudflare, and Fastly are beneficiaries in the CDN space along with Akamai. And Chronicle has done some fantastic work, um, and we have seen how Fastly has just continued to take off. Um, Akamai also has a potential setup for a breakout through $160 per share at some point. Um, consumers watching or reading online more content related to coronavirus or protests drive more CDN traffic. CDNs operate like toll booth models, meaning the more data that is consumed, the more CDN revenue that is generated. And the coming release of the Disney Plus uh, into the Western uh, Europe, which actually started to happen in May at the end of the month, um, at the end of the month of May, also is benefiting the entire space. So when you want to think about Cloudflare, it's basically a traffic accelerator. It is an essentially um, modern version of Cisco systems. The network interconnects with over 8,000 enterprises cloud services and ISP networks, and the company estimates it operates within 100 milliseconds of the internet connected population for 99% of the, 
of the developed world and 94% globally. Approximately 10% of the Fortune 1000 companies are paying customers and 10% of the top million websites use at least one Cloudflare solution. So the penetration has been improving and I think this has more room to run into the Fortune 1000 category. And then lastly, when I'm looking at the last earnings report, it was pretty impressive quarter. It came out on May 8th, on May 7th rather, and the company mentioned that its U.S. revenues increased by 44%, international increased by 52 and EMEA increased by 58%. Um, some of the biggest takeaways from the earnings report that gives me confidence that the company is seeing an acceleration from the shutdown period as well as the as well as the protest that's going on. Um, the inbound leads doubled in April. Cloudflare believes that the COVID experience is dramatically hastening the adoption of cloud technology. So the frictionless, the scalable, and uh, the performant um, architecture is, um, is a sharp contrast to the cumbersome, fragile, inefficient, high maintenance on-premise um, alternative. So, you know, in old school, if you were not on cloud, you were on on-premise, and on-premise means basically the old school server farms and such. And so if you're not in the office, not a lot of work is being done on that with everybody working from home. And that's how we have seen such a sharp acceleration in the cloud models for a lot of these companies. Uh, another tidbit that really caught my attention in earnings report, the management pointed out that the traffic growth doubled over March and April. So get this. Cloudflare estimates that they added a full year's worth of traffic in less than 12 weeks. And the network during that time operated flawlessly. So that's just remarkable growth rate. And then lastly, Cloudflare also noted on the call that they have added new enhanced processing to their Edge IT stack, which can process traffic 40% faster than the prior iteration. Um, and so that's also helping the company. And then just one last point, and I don't think this is completely baked into consensus view yet. Uh, we know JD.com and some of these internet companies have ripped higher the Chinese internet companies in recent days uh, because of the acceleration in the e-commerce trends in China. Well, uh, China deal with JD.com, which was announced by Cloudflare a couple months ago, um, is now going to broaden the reach and diversifies China concentration. And so the company mentioned that they're not yet adding any upside to revenues from the deal with the JD.com into their projections estimates at this point. However, they expect to open 50 new cities in China starting from middle of this year. So that should be generally about now. So if they're going to start reopening these into more cities with GD partnership, then I think that by the end of the year, they should be at a well into the progress related to this deal. And I think a lot of those revenues will start to come into play by the end of the year. So this bet that we are seeing in the November 32 call options yesterday could very well be on that alone. Same with the August 30 strike calls as well as the December 25 calls. So. The chart has been strong, valuations are crazy high, I get that, but I think in this particular case, the growth is actually accelerating, there's a lot of catalyst involved, and it looks really good. And I think pullbacks will remain shallow and the stock is more upside ahead. It should get into mid to high 30s and possibly even into 40s in a couple months. So that's the only one I have to discuss, and I'll be watching this stock closely today, and I may go ahead and issue a trade idea in this one. So that's it from me. Avo, what do you have? All right. Uh, well, well, while you were doing that, the uh, data came out for the uh, uh, continuous claims. Uh, it's a little higher. Actually, it's a million higher, but it, compared to 20 million, I guess it's not that much difference. So it's a million higher than uh, was forecast. Uh, futures a little lower on that. What was the continuing claims? Do you have? Um... Yeah, it was 21.4. Well, 21.5, let's say, versus 20.05. So I Previous see the. Was... Yeah, previous month was lower. Uh, previous uh, report was revised slightly lower. Okay, 
So the initial claims is still very bad at 1.8 million. That number continues to be pretty high. It's still even the 10 or 11 weeks into this. It's not mm -hmm. coming down fast enough. But it looks like if you start to see some sort of uh, you know normalizing trend in the continuing claims, I think we're starting to settle out in the low 20 millions and range. You know, call it 21 to 22 million. The continuing claim is starting to stabilize there. So that just another reflection of, you know, if we tie the knots with this one, with the ADP report that came out yesterday, that there is a good chance that the peak unemployment rate is now behind us. And we'll find out tomorrow morning at 8.30 when the when the May job report comes out, what that peak unemployment report looks like. It could be, uh, my expectations are it would be near 20%. But I think if that's the worst, then we're going to start to see. You see, the problem is that if the initial claims are at 1.8, 1.9 million, the pressure is still on for the economy to create very quick, large sum of jobs from reopening. Otherwise, the, the difficulty here is that the continuing claim may stabilize in short term, but they're going to eventually go up even more unless the initial claims start to come down much much further follow my logic over here and so this is a stabilization trend i wouldn't call this peak and then come you know unemployment rate, rate peaks and then start to come down sharply uh it's more of a stabilization trend around 20 percent. i would say right now we'll get the more accurate figure tomorrow when F nfp data comes out all right okay um i don't have anything new to bring just uh wanted to point out that the uh travel related stocks continue to do well specifically the airlines and um spirit airlines in particular which we had brought up a couple of days ago has man that was a great a, call i was yeah. able to pay, i was i day traded this yesterday after you covered it in this uh in the in the conversations in the morning because i had my alert set set uh once i saw this and i said okay you know we're seeing some very heavy heavy accumulation behind this move which means ultimately it's going to bust higher so I day traded it this yesterday and I was out by the end of the day. But let's see if he gets some follow through today because you're right, a lot of these airlines, in fact, look at the Spirit Airlines this morning again, up another $2 on a percentage basis. That's up another 11, 12%. So now it's going to open near $20 in pre market. And same thing with uh, United Airlines. Yeah, um, Southwest as well. Yeah, Southwest Airlines. Uh, yeah, clearly money moving into a lot of these airlines right now as we start to reopen. Now, I, I'm just wondering if uh, partially it has to do with, uh, well, I'm sure it has something to do with it in any case, uh, reopening plans in Vegas, uh, especially for Southwest, which has a huge uh, f number of flights that go in and out of Vegas. So, you know, trying to get things uh, going in the States, uh, hopefully Canada as well. And slowly we'll get back to some sort of normalcy. Uh, that's what I wanted to point out. The other thing yeah. I wanted to point out. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. And the other one I wanted to point out was, uh, and I tried to try to kind of make heads or send tails of this, but I couldn't. The Nor Norwegian Cruise Line yesterday had a huge buy in January 2022 calls, but they went out all the way to the 75 strike. I assume maybe it's just something to do with the low dollar because I mean they don't have to wait till seventy-five dollar tag to to uh, to sell it. Um, and no. I checked if it was a swap out of uh, common. I I it didn't seem that way. But another travel-related stock that is seeing a lot of action. So you know, for for my up. sake, for my sake, you know, I it's one thing to make a bull case on airlines, or or even for departmental stores like Nordstrom, as Chronicle talked about yesterday in conversations, and that by the way, also had a big rally yesterday, and I think it's going to possibly see even more follow through today. One thing to talk about these because of the reasons that we discuss, you know, balance sheet uh, recapitalization. Um, they can possibly live through a storm for a couple more months, maybe even a couple quarters uh, that buys them more time and such and such. But honestly, as far as the cruise ships are concerned, those are some of the most toxic assets that are out there if, if one wants to bet on an eventual recovery, because this industry will have to reinvent itself in many, many different ways. And they're not the ones that are able to get any kind of bailout packages from the government in any shape or form because they're not 
domiciled in the U.S. or really any country. So, um, you know, a lot of the balance sheet uh, liquidity injections that have happened in some of these companies, cruise ships particularly, it's been led by the private sector. There are some rumors out there that I saw also a couple of days ago in Norwegian Air, Norwegian cruise lines that there's some activists may step in i think those are the reasons but frankly this is this is a uh, far more riskier than some of the other assets that are depressed from this covid related shutdowns just my view all right uh jay what do you have if uh, uh so today uh kicking things off keeping with the sports betting and iGaming theme. Yeah. Um, just wanted to point out that an investment firm called Roundhill Investments is launching today, according to their page, uh, the sports betting and iGaming ETF. Uh, the ticker for that is going to be uh, BETZ bets. B oh, that's B awesome. Yeah. Um, looking at their top 10 holdings, uh, number one is DraftKings at 7.02%. Uh, number two is Flutter Entertainment, which is uh, based in Ireland. Uh, yep. That comes in at 6.53%. And then number three is GAN Limited at 5.79%. Um, oh, I love this. This is going to yeah. open up more ways for people to invest in the space. So that's that's great stuff. Yep. Uh, and then number two, another stock that is launching today that people may want to know about is uh, Nikola Motor. Uh, the ticker there is going to be – hold on one second – going to be NKLA. Uh, so this is the all electric class eight truck company. Um, it had, it, it merged with the VTIQ, the Vecto IQ acquisition that, that we brought up in chat, I think about a week ago. Um, so it's already trading some, uh, I think almost, almost 200,000 in volume pre-market. Um, so just a stock to keep an eye on. Okay, so the first one was B E T Z. That's the yep. that's the Round Hill Sports Betting ETF. Correct. I, I hope they have options listed on this one. This according was this... to their page, they at this time they do not. Okay. But it is launching today, according to their page. Yeah, and then the second one was the uh, N K L A, the electric. Yeah. Uh, all right, it's going to open yep. around thirty five. It looks like it. That's where it's trading in pre market. We'll be watching this one closely, uh, considering that electric vehicles continue to remain a hot spot. Um, this could be a winner too. This could may this may perform well. I need to go back and I need to look at their SEC filings. I need to look at their S1 filing, particularly see what the company is made up of. So I'm completely dark mm -hmm. on Nicola. Uh, something maybe you can take a look at and come back with your thoughts, and then I can mm -hmm. add my own, and we can cover this in more detail. Sounds good to me. Sure. Uh, Chronicle. Yeah, so uh, today I'm looking at AMC Entertainment. Uh, symbol for that is AMC. Yesterday they reported preliminary quarterly revenue of 942 million versus consensus 963. Uh, they also guided to putting a stop to their dividend payments. They also expect their EBITDA to decline by 97%. All in, they're expecting to post a $2.4 billion loss for the quarter inclusive of a lot of charges. Wow. I know I talked a lot about uh, buying trash for a trade yesterday, but this is one I wouldn't consider buying. Uh, if we look at the chart, the stock has run up 150% from March lows, mostly because of hope uh, that there would be a private rescue. And also recently the company announced that it began private offers to exchange $2.3 billion in debt for 12% uh, Lian debt, so basically a refinance. And so this is partly why the stock has run up. But if we look at today's first read, uh, Barrington was out with a note, basically calling the company out on their misleading press release because the note states that even if that debt is fully exchanged, the interest expense level would remain unchanged with potential to um, actually add to the debt balance down the road. And so what this means is that if we continue to get a slow recovery in, in box office levels, then um, AMC is going to remain extremely indebted and they will have to repay at a much higher interest rate in the future on top of that. 
So if we look at their balance sheet and debt maturities, it's a mess even after factoring this $2.3 billion refinancing attempt. Like we're talking $4.7 billion in debt with roughly $75 million of interest expense every quarter with anticipated negative cash flows. And so it's no guarantee. It's also no guarantee that they can exchange 100% of that debt in the, in the offering. So to top it all off, AMC themselves yesterday included a comment in their 8K filing saying, quote unquote, substantial doubt exists about our ability to continue for a reasonable period of time. So it looks like they themselves are saying that this refinancing, which all the bulls have been so excited about, is not likely to be, be the panacea that's being priced in. And for the record, uh, management said they only have enough liquidity to last until November. So if we look at the December option chain, I know the implied volatility here is really expensive, but the way I look at it is that the market makers are smart people. And the reason they're setting the IV really high is because they know these options will, are very likely to end up in the money anyway. Um, personally, I'm, I like the $2 strike puts going for 60 cents, around 60 cents. So if the company goes bankrupt, I make uh, $1.40. And if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm only out 60 cents per option. So it's about 2.3 to one risk reward here. Yeah, it could work uh, for sure. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is some great uh, uh, forensic work on the on the stock. Let me just add one color to this. A lot of the time, when a struggling company with mounting losses, deteriorating margins, and um, it, you know gets a large liquidity injection of some point from the banks or the private companies, and every situation is a bit different. Being a former restructuring advisor, I can tell you this, that a lot of the times uh, banks or, 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 or large investors might be willing to put money into higher lien debt that is fully secured by the company's assets in before a bankruptcy potentially, because they know that eventually there's going to be a pre-packaged bankruptcy plan that will come out and, and their assets will be um, more or less nearly 100% secured by by the claims, by the senior claims on the company's assets if there is a bankruptcy. But at the time when they're putting the money in, before the prepackaged bankruptcy announced, they're buying the debt at a very, very attractive price, sometimes 60 cents on the dollars or 80 cents on the dollar, while getting paid a hefty amount of interest for the time being, for the time being when the company is still surviving. So they make money during that period and then the prepackaged bankruptcy comes and they have the highest claim to the assets and they come out just fine taking over the assets which then can be liquidated this is a very normal and you know a lot of the time you know people may actually confuse this kind of uh, transaction that happens before prepackaged bankruptcy plans are announced that as if the company is securing large amount of debt to secure you know, to boost its balance sheet liquidity but ultimately it's really just a play on the bankruptcy itself and many people simply don't realize that like i said being a former you know restructuring advisor to distressed companies for 6 years in chicago as a management consultant i did a lot of those prepackaged bankruptcy filings around the country and so i played this game and i went to the courts in delaware 16 times um, you know the the bankruptcy courts in delaware uh, with my excel models and all of that to show the laws uh, the the lawmakers uh, the court systems as well as the financial advisors attorneys everybody how this thing is going to work so um, this is interesting so one has to mo monitor this because if it breaks technically this trend support here let's call it four dollars and eighty cents then yes i could see this thing quickly return to three dollars per share uh, Great stuff. Um, all right. So, by the way, the S&P futures, just to quickly mention here, it started to weakening a little bit because as the conference started with ECB, ECB is now saying that it sees the full year 2010, 2020 European Union GDP shrinking by 8.7%. This is pretty bad because it's one thing to say we're going to be down a lot in the second quarter and then we're going to bounce back materially to have the full year being down only slightly or maybe even flat but in this case they just set a target that they see 2020 gdp for the full continent the entire european union shrinking for the full year 
by 8.7 percent and that's their baseline assumptions at this point um market is not liking this news so the, uh, the s p future started to uh, weaken on this and i think unfortunately this may actually now pressure some banks so watch financials and how they will react as the day goes on all right thank you very much everybody for joining we'll see you in the chat room shortly